At the beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, there were experiments which showed that light could sometimes be interpreted as particles, sometimes as waves, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and Schrodinger, you know, the, the physicist, wanted to find a math model for this wave behavior. Uh, in other words, you know, find the math object which would be isomorphic to what the particles were showing in the physical world. Now, he also knew that in classical physics, an operator called a Hamiltonian allows to describe the movement of objects over time, you know. And in fact, as you probably know, it represents the energy of the object, you know, the kinetic energy plus potential energy. Now, on the other hand, we've seen that in quantum physics, um, the, the particles are described by, by their state, which may depend on time and are represented by norm vectors you know, like this. And we've also seen that there are two types of states in quantum physics, you know, the omega states, which are states where we can measure a property omega, and the other states where we can only determine a probability of being in a given omega state upon next measurement. Now, to preserve the, the relations, uh, and in particular, the differences between states, there is always, uh, you know, a linear relation between them. And so the evolution of a quantum system from time uh, t equal to zero uh, can be modeled like this, using this function u uh, of t. And the operator u, you know, function of time must be unitary. Uh, there's a theorem that says that unitary implies invariant for inner products. And I remind you uh, what unitarity means here. Um, so if we express the function to go from one state to, you know, a closed state in, in time, we can write this. That the, the state at uh, t plus epsilon time, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, for, from, from the previous state, you, you remove something to go to the next state. Or you could also consider that you add something, you know, it's the same thing here. And whatever H means here, UT and phi T could be complex, so we can multiply them by I, you know. And in fact, writing it this way will simplify calculations, and we'll see later uh, why uh, this actually must be uh, complex and not just uh, real. So if we write it under this form, and for T equals zero, we, we get that, you know, and which is equal to this here. So uh, U of epsilon is equal to this, and therefore, we get its uh, Hermitian conjugate here like that. That means that since um, u is unitary, we get that, which is equal to that, and therefore we get this, you know, uh, according to a, a gentleman named Taylor, you know, since epsilon is close to zero, we have this part here, which is equal to zero, and therefore, that means that the Hermitian conjugate of H minus H is equal to zero, which means that H is a Hermitian operator. Uh, and so since it's a Hermitian operator, we can measure it, you know, and of course, as you guessed, um, that's the Hamiltonian, which uh, usually represents energy. Now, what does all of this have to do with waves? Well, wait, we're going to see that pretty soon. So this is what we got from the previous slide. And therefore, uh, by definition of the derivative, we get this result here, which is almost the time-dependent Schrodinger's equation. Now, you may ask, uh, again, you know, why this i here? Well, you know, h represents an observable and is therefore a Hermitian operator, as we've seen, and it usually represents the energy that makes quantum objects change state. But the derivative operator, partial d over partial dt, if you calculate it, it it's actually anti-Hermitian. Now, what do you do to transform an anti-Hermitian operator into a Hermitian operator? Yeah, you multiply it by i or minus i, which is the same, and then it becomes Hermitian. So that's what we do here, because we know that h is a Hermitian operator. So. We have this, uh, you know, the, the h constant uh, is to make sure we are coherent with uh, currently used units. Oh, and also I forgot to say that, um, well, this is the uh, 
time dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. This is called the time independent Schrodinger equation. And you know, you have to remember since H is Hermitian, its eigenvectors make up a, a basis for the set of states, you know. So any state can be represented like this, you know, where these are the eigenvectors for H. So if we develop, you know, these equations here, we get something like that, which again is equal to this, you know, it's fairly easy uh, to follow. And from there, well, we develop and we get this. So from, from this, we get this, and therefore we get that. And if you've done some math before, uh, this looks like a you know, known equation. And the, the solution for this equation are exponentials, and in that case, complex exponential. You know? So that means that the AJT, you know, the coefficients, are equal to this. And these are the solutions. For, for this equation here. And since these are a complex exponential, that means, you know, they are based of cosine and sine functions. Therefore, that means they are periodic waves. Yes, <laughs> the coefficients are wave and we have proven it now. And we've seen in a previous video, you know, uh, about Hilbert spaces, I think, that they also were directly linked to the probability of going from one state to the next. So we just saw that the states can be represented by a sum of eigenstates like that, you know, uh, from the energy, uh, the Hamiltonian, and that's called a superposition of states, uh, which is kind of misleading, and I've explained why in another video. Uh, and we also just saw that the coefficients were waves, okay? But we also saw that they were inner products, you remember, in a previous video. Uh, and for instance, here, the alpha j would be the inner product of psi and ej vec um, eigenvector here. So because of the characteristics of the inner product, the bigger the coefficients, you know, the alpha j will be, the closer the states will be or the least different, because the inner product measures the amount of similarity. And I guess the thrifty universe principle tells us that this means more probability to reach EJ states for the next measurements, because the action will be minimal. And we can also see that the square of the alpha J, which is equal to this, defines how close psi is to ej and ej to psi, you know, which is not the same because they are complex numbers. So alpha j squared will give the probability to go from psi to ej states. Now let's look at the concrete example here, uh, the Thomasian experiment. Uh, first with one slit. So basically there is a light ray coming from this slit here, which goes to that screen here on the bottom, and in this simulation, you know, that's just a simulation, the ripples are calculated according to the coefficients that we saw in the previous slide. So they represent the probability for a particle to be at some point in this plane, like here, for instance, uh, on the screen, which means that the lighter the ripple, the more chance we have to see particles at, at that position. And that is because of photons arriving at the points near the center of the screen arrive nearly at the same time, and therefore the corresponding coefficient phases are almost the same. Or if you prefer, the inner products become bigger, which is the same thing. So when you add the corresponding waves, well, they add up. Uh, but as you go further away from the center of the screen, the phases for closed point coefficients differ more to the point where the waves can gradually cancel each other out, you know, because of the phase difference. Now, if instead of one, we use two slits like this here, uh, well, the probability functions interfere because there are periodic functions, you know, <laughs> waves, uh, which is what we saw a few slides ago. And here again, we send a large number of particles, so they will follow the probability rule, uh, you know, according to the patterns that we see here, you know. And it doesn't mean that particles will go through both holes at all, you know, or that photons interfere with themselves. <laughs> you know, that's crazy. And it doesn't mean that light rays are waves. It just means that the probability of presence will be higher here and then decrease, then increase again 
because you have to add waves going through one slit and arriving to a point to the waves going through the second slit and arriving to the same point here. And these waves interfere because, well, <laughs> you know, they are periodic functions by definition. Okay, so that's why you see interferences when sending lights through two slits. So to summarize, the most fundamental uh, equation in quantum physics implies the use of complex numbers. Complex exponentials are a solution of equations which describe the behavior of particles, you know, and therefore also, as we just saw, explain their wave-like so-called duality perception. And so that means that, you know, okay, they are not necessarily intuitive, but the use of complex numbers really simplifies, the, you know, the, the modeling of, of quantum particles' behaviors. And last but not least, they help us understand the so-called wave-particle duality and the uh, superposition of states in a logical way. And this is great because, you know, I hate when things are not logical. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs>